as we get started, I'm not saying that you're going to get offended this morning, but there is a possibility that you may get offended because I'm going to talk about some things that if you're still doing tillage, might be, I'm not saying you will be, but might be slightly offensive, okay? Now, I encourage you guys, if you feel yourself getting offended, remember, I've been harassed, mocked, ridiculed and stuff all, I've got a TikTok video making fun of me and calling me a hypocrite for all my videos. I'm not offended by that because I'm choosing not to be offended. So if you guys find yourself Jay saying something that I don't really like what he's saying, guess what? You get to choose whether or not you're offended. And I encourage you guys, make the choice. Don't be offended. Learn. And hey, if you're being offended, just accept that I'm wrong and it doesn't bother you that I'm wrong. All right? Everybody else that's not offended, we're going to have fun. All right, here we go. The wreck of the Hes uh, the wreck of the uh, whale ship Essex. How many of you guys know about the tragedy of the whale ship Essex? Nobody knows that story. Anybody see the movie In the Heart of the Sea? Okay. Anybody ever hear about the book Moby Dick? Okay. Uh, Herman Melville wrote the book Moby Moby Dick after interviewing the um, Pollard. I can't remember the guy's name uh, first name. Paul, the captain of of the Essex. Um, Horman Melville went to his house and, and interviewed him. And that's where he got the, the idea from the firsthand account of the, the, the tragedy of the Essex. That's how he wrote Moby Dick. So there was this whale ship in the 1800s that whaling was, was huge. Like we don't even think about it today because we don't use, you know, the, the, it's illegal to hunt sperm whales now. But in the 1800s, they didn't have petroleum. So everything that, that fueled the Industrial Revolution was all on the oil that came from these sperm whales. And so the, this book is fascinating if you like historical books because it, it goes through in the beginning and talks about the history of whaling, how it blew up in the United States. The United States would, like produced way, way more oil uh, from, from sperm whales than any other country. And so it's something that really helped fuel our economy. But anyway, this ship, the, um, the Essex, leaves Nantucket and goes down to where they were planning on hunting whales around the, the Cape, uh, I think it's the Cape of Good Hope around the, the tip of South Africa. And there wasn't enough whales there. And so they're like, all right, we got to go over to the Galapagos Islands. So they sail to the Galapagos Islands and harvest sea turtles for meat on their ship off the Galap Galapagos Islands. And then they went a thousand miles off the coast of South, or South America and started hunting whales. And so as they're hunting whales, there's three men um, on the ship, uh, Owen Chase, who wrote the book, The Wreck of the Whale Ship Essex. I'm listen I listen to the In the Heart of the Sea. So In the Heart of the Sea, if you're going to listen to the story, is the one you want to listen to. But anyway, Owen Chase and some other men are on the ship, and he looks out, and there's this 80-foot whale out in the, the distance, and all of a sudden the whale charges straight at the ship, hits the ship, and then comes around, hits it again. And by the time the other men that were out whaling a whale, they brought a whale in, and they're like, what the heck happened? It's like, we've been stowed by a whale, Captain. So they loaded up as many sea turtles as they could in these tiny little um, boats that they had for, what do you call those off the safety boats? We have, sure, whatever they are called. They loaded those up and they, they started go, like trying to get back to land. But the problem was they didn't have the prevailing winds that they needed to get back to South America. So they just kept going south until they hit an island. They stopped an island. They ate all the crabs off the island. And then they finally made it back. Only eight men survived. The other men starved to death and they ate the men that starved to death to survive. It's a, it's a tragic, tragic story. But the other tragedy that I realized as I was listening to this book is if we wouldn't have came up with petroleum, if we wouldn't have, have, have found petroleum, we would have hunted the sperm whale to extinction. The sperm whales have never recovered from from the uh, from from hunting that that we've done all over of the sperm whales, and the reason there was such rampant um, whaling in the 1800s is because it was brilliant capitalism. They didn't pay these men a salary. They didn't pay them hourly. They said you get a percentage of the whales that you hunt. So everybody on that ship is all in on getting as many whales hunted and all the 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 oil from the sperm whale that they can collect as possible. And so th that was, was perfect for the model of getting whales, but it was devastating to the population of sperm whales. 
and they would have hunted them to extinction had we not found petroleum. So the reason I bring this up is because as I was listening to that book, I'm like, we're not much different in farming. They did not stop hunting sperm whales even when they got to the coast of... The, like, they used to just leave Nantucket and go 60 miles and hunt all the sperm whales they wanted. A few years were wasn't any sperm whales around Nantucket. They had to go further south and further south until they were out around the, South America. And then they're like, oh, there's none here. Let's, let's go off the coast of the Galapagos Islands. And never did it enter their mind, we may be hunting these animals to extinction. But as farmers... We're not doing anything different with our soil. Where's all of our topsoil going? Do you guys know where? Why is that picture? Not? Oh, that's the next slide. You guys recognize this picture? People from Tribune, raise your hand. Okay, that's our county. The rest of you in this room, have you seen this picture? That's because it's gone around Facebook. This is like, in December, this was one of the most shared photos on Facebook. Do you think our topsoil goes up in the air and then goes somewhere else and settles somewhere else and it just goes to this magical other place? No, we lose that topsoil when we lose it in these major erosion events. It's estimated that 57.6 billion metric tons of topsoil have been lost in the Midwest due to erosion. A study by the Sanford professor, Eric, I can't pronounce his last name, showed that a loss of 1% of top, we have a low one, loss of topsoil of 1% every single year. The United States is losing topsoil 10 times faster than it can be replaced. I was talking to a farmer locally about regenerative agricultural practices, and he got mad at me. He said, well, we've been doing it this way for 100 years. He's like, I don't think we need to change the tried and true methods. Well, when you lose 1% of something, it doesn't seem like you're losing it very fast, does it? You can't see your topsoil and your fields going down with your naked eye. But over time, you can see it. How many, you guys have any old windrows around your, far, in your ground? What is by an old windrow or an old fence row? What is there? What? Sand dune. Or what is that? It's not actual sand. It's what? Topsoil. We're losing topsoil. We have to accept that fact. We are farming in a context where we are losing 10 times more so topsoil than what we can replace. So we are losing it. How do we build it back up? This is just a chart that shows you what percent of our ground is actually degraded in the United States. In the United States, we are at North America, so 74%. Total of in the world, they estimate 70% of farm ground in the world has been degraded. This is an awesome book. This has nothing to... Okay, so let's say that you do not accept my premise that we are losing that much topsoil. Okay, that's fair. You can like we can argue that that point whether or not the Stanford scientist is accurate. We can that's fine. How many of you guys love arguing against history and saying history didn't happen? This book is awesome. You, anybody that has not read that book should read this book because he goes through and explains in detail how the Romans fell as a nation, not because of the the um, what was it the barbarians, not because the barbarians got so efficient in warfare but because they stopped being able to feed their people because their agricultural practices were so bad, their land got so degraded that they could not produce the crops they needed to feed the entire nation. They had mass starvation, and then they fell as a nation. Do they teach you that in history? No, I don't know why, but they don't. There's an awesome uh, Greek philosopher that recognized that they had terrible erosion in Athens. And so he goes to the Senate in Athens, and he's like, hey, we need to outlaw tillage in Athens, wanted to outlaw tillage in, in ancient Greece and in, in for, for the, the city-state of Athens. He got laughed out like he lost a lot of his privileges as a senator. And in 60 years, they could no longer farm the fields that he wanted to outlaw tillage on because it was completely degraded and you could not grow anything on it. So we pretend like this is, this is something that's never happened before. No one's ever lost their topsoil. But there is example after example after example. I really should have wrote this down, but I for, I'm forgetting it. You guys know the, the amazing... Uh, Dad, you went there, I'm pretty sure. The, where's Dad at? Okay, Dad, what's, what's the, the Indian uh, cliffs in Arizona where they had this amazing city in, uh, that the Indians built on the side of the... Mesa Verde, thank you. 
Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. So Colorado, not Arizona or whatever. They have Mesa Verde where that amazing, the uh, what, what, what's the word? I'm, the village they have on the side of the cliff. Everybody knows what I'm talking about, right? The cliff. Thank you. They have evidence of forest being there a thousand years ago. What happened to the forest? The people at Mesa Verde cut it down to use for all the things that they needed it for. Is, it, is there a forest there in Mesa Verde now? No. A thousand years ago, there was a forest down there. They deforest it, and are they a civilization any longer? No. Do we know why? No. But a lot of people believe it's because they completely desecrated their agriculture and could not survive as a society and moved on from this amazing civilization that they built. That book is full of stories of people that have destroyed their civilization because of bad agricultural practices. I do not want to follow the pathway that these that the, they went down. Um, so if we do not accept that we're losing topsoil, if we do not accept history, can we accept that we're creating massive amounts of dead zones all around the world? Do you guys know what these are? Do you guys who raise your hand if you know what a dead zone is? Okay, look around the room. Less than half of us know what a dead zone is. I did not know what a dead zone was until this year. These dead zones are caused by excess nitrogen and phosphorus that have been lost due to erosion go into our waterways. And when you have excess nitrogen and excess phosphorus, you have algae that blooms. When the algae blooms, it dies. And then there's an, uh, it takes all the oxygen out of that area in the water and nothing can live in that area except for jellyfish. We're doing this. There's 160 of those. The largest one is off the coast of, um, I think it's Louisiana. It's in the Gulf of Mexico, 8,000 square feet. No, 8,000 8, square miles. Thank you. 8,000 square miles. It's the size of New Jersey in the Gulf of Mexico where nothing can live. We have to change. And it's not just like, like, I know this is, most of us are from Kansas. Most of us are from dry areas and this doesn't affect us. But if we don't collectively as a society and as farmers recognize, we can, we have the tools that necessary to change what we're doing. Nothing's going to change. This goes over how dead zones are caused. Okay. All right. Now, whether or not you don't accept the last three pr pr uh, principles that we just talked about, these companies do. Nestle, General Mills, Pepsi, Walmart, and Lando Lakes. These are their missions going forward. Nestle, one of the growing numbers of big food companies supporting the transition to regenerative farming in the United States with the goal of letting their soil thrive by reducing plowing and keeping bugs, carbon, and other nutrients in the ground. General Mills, goal of adopting regenerative practices on 1 million acres of farm ground by 2030. Pepsi-Cola, Goal of transitioning 7 million acres of farmland to regenerative agriculture by 2030. Walmart, we will directly support 30,000 Midwest farmers in their transition to regenerative farming by 2030. Lando Lakes, we need these farmers to maintain soil health systems 10, 20, and 50 years over multiple generations. Now, do these people care about regenerative agriculture? No, yes, maybe, I don't know. They definitely care about their public image. And this is the image that they're portraying to the public. And to back up what they're saying, they're starting all over the United States. These companies that are helping, they're, they're fitting the bill for it, where they're paying farmers to switch to regenerative. Some regenerative farmers are really excited about this because it's going to get more and more people to do regenerative agriculture. Some people hate it because what it's eventually, they think, what it's eventually going to lead to is a regenerative label. And you fall under these you know, parameters of what regenerative labeling or of what you're doing. Okay. I'm from Kansas. Kevin's from Kansas. Kevin, how different are our farms? Quite a bit. We still have the same vision and drive to become regenerative. We're going about it two, di two different way ways of doing it. Okay. But we're both feel regenerative. Kevin, you think it's going to be awesome when they put us in a box? No. So it has its pros and it has its cons. Whether I like it or not, this is the way the world's going. Whether you like it or not, this is the way the world's going. Mike uh, Organic, where are you at, Mike Organic? 
Mike's doing organic in Colorado. Unfortunately for Mike, Mike's been progressive for a long time. He's made the decision to switch over to organic. They're going to shut you down if you don't if you don't quit tilling. And it, whether we like it or not, they're going to say, hey, tillage is bad because of all this erosion and all the things I just talked about. And whether we like it or not, whether we're excited about the transition or not, do you think the government is going to be more invasive or less invasive in the next 20 years? If they're going to be more invasive in the next 20 years, what do you think they're going to do after these major wind events? What do you think they're thinking about these dead zones that we're creating? They're going to eventually step in whether we like it or not. So it's up to us to start making the transition so they can stay the heck out of our lives. Okay, if we don't do it, they're going to do it for us and we're not going to like it. So this is the future, whether we like it or not. Um, so here's how we fix the problem. What's the most common question farmers ask themselves about besides how much rain did you get? When they talk what, after harvest, what, is, what do all farmers ask each other? How did you yield? Why is that stupid? T tell me, why is it stupid? Hudson, do I know how much nitrogen you applied to your field? No. Do I, AJ, do I know how much nitrogen you applied to your field? If AJ applies 75 pounds of nitrogen and Hudson applies 20 pounds of nitrogen, and they both, and he yields uh, 85 bushels an acre and he yields 75, who is more profitable? Well, with grain prices, $9, probably AJ, but still, right? We have no idea who applied what to their field. We have no idea how much money he spent in chemical or how much he spent in chemical. We have no idea any of those things. So why are we measuring each other next to yield? When we have rain events and we say, well, I got an inch, I got 75. Why don't we say, I got all of it. I got all of my rain because my ground is farmed in a context where my field filtrates more ground than my ne next door neighbor. And that's awesome. I'm, I'm capturing all the rain. Why aren't we encouraging and inspiring each other to go into more regenerative practices? Hey, why don't we ask, what book did you read about regenerative agriculture? What, what podcast have you been listening to that's inspired you to become a better farmer? Why, why aren't we asking these questions that inspire us to become greater than asking questions like, how much range you get? How'd your fields yield? Those are the things that we need to be th thinking about. How can we always be becoming better farmers? How can we sharpen the people around us? If this is, this is a thing that, that really excited me this year. This is a uh, volunteer Milo growing where I'm planting Milo. And as I dug up that plant to see the roots, I found my first earthworm on our, on our uh, dry land ground. First one, I've, I've got a ton on my irrigated ground. This is the first one I found on our dry land ground. We can change our ground and bring back earthworms and dung beetles and all of the life. It will take time, but we can change. Right now we're focused on yield and we're killing the golden goose, which is our soil. If we focus, stop focusing on yield and we start focusing, I'm going to have my soil in the healthiest position to where it's going to produce the healthiest crops, then we're going to be extremely profitable because we'll not only be focusing about how much money we're making, we're going to be focused on something else. Raise your hand if you've been doing regenerative agriculture for more than five years. Okay, keep them high real quick. Everybody, keep your hand up. If you are happier now than you were when you first started, keep your hand up. I didn't say put your hand down. If you're happier now than you were when you first started, raise, drop your hand. If you're happier now. Every single person that raised their hand is happier now. It brings so much joy to your life because you're thinking about the context of which you're, what, where you're farming and what, what you can create and the life you can bring back to your fields, not what, what do I got to kill, right? One, one thing that dad and I still, like I had a paradigm shift because I would go out and I'd pull up weeds and I'd pull up our, our, uh, our cash crops. And I'd look at the root system and over and over and over again, it was almost like 50 to 60% of the time when I pulled up this particular plant, it always had a uh, fungus connected to the root system. Do you guys know what plant it was? I had a YouTube video about it. What is it? Pigweed. So I'm like, dad, look at all the things this pigweed's doing. And dad's like, I still freaking hate that thing. <laughs> right. But my paradigm shift, because like I have this pigweed out, it's sucking a jack ton of moisture out of the ground, but you know what else it's doing? It's harvesting micronutrients from the ground. And because of that, that uh, there's saprophytic funguses. 
But because of those funguses, those fungus are bringing the pigweed micronutrients it needs. And through those fungal colonies, they're sharing micronutrients with my corn plant. Yes, they are taking up moisture, but they're giving a benefit to my corn. Okay, this is how we build topsoil. It takes 100 years to develop topsoil. And it's built through these aggregates, okay? When you pull up your root system, you want to see dreadlocks coming off your roots, okay? You should have Rastafarian roots. Glenn came from eastern Kansas. You stopped by some place. We won't mention it, okay? You, you toured their farm, and you pulled up their roots under irrigated ground, and what did you see? Did they look like that? No, they did not look like that. Why do they, why do they not look like that? What, what are they doing there? Just, just, are they doing tillage on that farm? Are they doing tillage? You don't have to say. Okay. So look, when you have a system that is constantly tilling, you're constantly store, destroying aggregates. Our plants should have the dreadlock look. This is a, how many people love Texas windmill grass? No, we all hate it because we can't kill it. But what is Texas windmill grass doing? It's building soil. It's there for a purpose. God didn't create Texas windmill grass to be like, I want to curse you, right? He created Texas windmill grass to fix our soils. That Texas windmill grass, I've never pulled up Texas windmill grass and saw bare roots. Never. It always has an amazing rise of sheath on it. I hate it, but it always has an amazing rise of sheath. Aggregates are created when plants put out exudates. So the, I got this uh, picture from Clint Freeze in Illinois. The roots, the, those brace roots haven't hit the ground yet, but they are putting out exudates. This is the only photo I've ever seen that actually showed the plant putting out exudates because the, the brace roots are trying to get down there, but they're secreting those exudates. So what's taking place, for those of you who don't know, a plant wants to put out secrete exudates, okay? The exudates are a glomulin. They're full of carbon. They're full of sugar, sugars. And those sugars bind soil particles together. And that's how aggregates are formed. Every plant uh, does this. They secrete, well, maybe not uh, brassicas. But anyway, they secrete these exudates. And those exudates bind soil, soil particles together. And that's how our soils are created. Aggregates increase filtration. This is our irrigated ground. Okay? This is after an inch of rain and right after the, 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 uh, the spur circle passed. I could walk out on top of our soil and yet still sick my finger down in the soil because of the poor spacing we've created just in the last four years of doing no-till on this circle and doing cover crops on this circle and not doing any tillage on this circle. Those aggregates will build up over time and we will create poor spacing in our fields. We'll be able to filtrate more water if we follow these principles. So it's not just that we're able to keep our topsoil we're all actually able to build soil and increase the amount of water that we're a, the water holding capacity of our fields. This is my neighbor's field. Same day. Same, I'm guessing he's putting about the same amount of water down. I walked into his field. I sank that far into the, into the, into this ground. So look, you guys see that? What, what is right in front of me? Standing water. Do you see any standing water there? Why? We have better filtration. Listen, if you're in Greeley County and you're still doing tillage, I'm not knocking on any of you. We tilled three fields this year, okay? I, I, I have nothing against people who are tilling because you've been taught this in your entire life. This is the system that you've, you've grown up in. This is all you know. So when a when the guy from your community comes and tells you something completely different than you've known your entire life, I understand it's a shell shock and it's hard to hear. Like my neighbor, I love him. I'm not using his name because I love him because I don't want him to think I'm throwing him under, under the bus. All right? We But we have to understand there's a better, more efficient and functional way to farm. What do you guys see in the difference in these two root structures? One is, one is cereal rye. No, no, sorry. One is beardless triticale and one is wheat. But they should the, the the root structure should look similar. What is difference in the one on the right and the one on the left? What do you see on the one on the left, and what, what do you not see on the one on the right? What's say it louder? Root hairs. Okay, 
These red hairs are what put out the exudates and what build aggregates. The reason they're bare is because I took them and I banged the crap out of them on the bed of the pickup to knock all the aggregates off of, off of both of them so if we could see the actual root hairs. And you could. Uh, Glenn pointed out something else last night when I showed him these photos. The, the one on the left is whiter. What does that mean, Glenn? Calcium. Calcium. Which is probably a good thing. I'll have Glenn talk about that later. All right. Everybody complains about living in western Kansas because it doesn't what here? It doesn't rain here. Okay. Well, hey, if we got rain, I kind of imagine it looked like my buddy's field in Hungary. He posted this on, on Facebook. I don't think this is his field. It's just another person in Hungary. How would you guys like to harvest there? Okay. We do not have a lack of rain problem. We have a lack of filtration problem. Even if it rained here, our fields would look like that because we've been destroying our filtration abilities because of poor farming practices. This is our field. This is 2019 heading back from the bottom line conference. I stopped and took this picture. You might not be able to see it, but this is all of our topsoil in the ditch. This is after one inch of rain. How much, of, how much water did I keep from that one inch of rain? Hardly any of it. Because we tilt the crap out of the field, it can't handle the water events because there's no aggregates in the field. We destroy those aggregates every time we till. So there's no aggregates in the field. So we get major rain events. We have runoff. This is why they have dead zones outside of their, like, you can't even take your dog to the Lake of the Ozarks anymore because they'll be killed by the blue algae. They have it in Missouri. They have it all over where they have major, major uh, waterways. This is just another picture. Like everybody tells me I can't afford cover crops. I can't afford not to till. You can't afford to have your topsoil leaving your field every single year. It's not because it doesn't rain. It's because we are not able to filtrate the rain when we get it. Okay, this is another great example. So when I first created my first Johnson's 2, John Nicewanger came over. We treated our, uh, our seed with some of the compost that John made. And then we put some, we didn't treat it. We just put it with mez. So I, I uprooted those, like, I think it was two weeks after. And you can see what I did was, is I went to a field that it was no, it was no till. And I just got some soil from that no till field, put a little rock of mez down right next to the seed. Okay. And then I put down the, uh, this one I tree with a compost extract, no mez. What is it doing right here? Building soil. What are these bare roots? Okay, these are the things that work against aggr building aggregates. Whenever you till, you destroy aggregates, all right? Long fallow periods. Dad, I'm sorry to say this, but if we do long fallow periods this summer, we're going to kill aggregates, okay? I mean, the more we do it, the worse off it is. So, uh, synthetic phosphorus destroys aggregates. And it doesn't destroy it, I'm sorry. It keeps aggregates from forming. So what happens here when you put synthetic phos next to this plant it, the, the plant knows it's next to synthetic FOSS because as soon as it starts to develop its root system, it's like, oh my gosh, I have access to FOSS. I'm going to take all my energy and I'm going to suck up all the FOSS I can and I'm not going to put any energy out to producing exudates. So if you put FOSS in your ground, you're never going to build topsoil. You have to wean yourself off phosphorus if you want to build topsoil because you'll, you can't do it. Look, mes, no mes. Compost extract, no compost extract. All right, so excess nitrogen of more than 50 pounds does the same thing. When the plant sees all that nitrogen out there and it's like, I can take this nitrogen up right now because it's right next to the root system, sucks it up, but it won't put out exudates. Too much compaction and lack of diversity. All right, so lack of diversity works against the building of aggregates because once the plant and a monoculture starts to, even if you got the compost extract going on it and it starts to produce those roots, Plants want to have a relationship with other plants in the system. They want to share micronutrients with each other. Plants of the same species will not share micronutrients with one another. All right, so even our monoculture systems is, is not go going to help us long term. So to get us to where we're building aggregates and building soil, we want to follow the soil health principles that John Nicewanger is going to talk about. We also want to introduce cover crops into our system. Now, if you have cattle, that's the best way to introduce them, all right? If you don't have cattle, you can probably still get away with a cheap um, 
a cheap cover crop, do a summer cover crop mix, and then the next year go back to your Milo or your corn. Um, Larry Purdy, I really wish he was here. Larry has been doing cover crops in Greeley County longer than I have. All right, Larry, I think it for five years has been doing, at least five years, maybe longer than that, he'll do on his fallow period, he'll plant a spring cover crop mix. And then after a spring cover crop mix, he'll terminate that with, uh, with Paraquat, glyphosate, whatever he terminates it with. And he tries to get it to where he's only spraying once, but sometimes he has to spray twice. And then he plants his weed into that. That has worked every year for him, but one year. And I've been told by other people that his, his wheat looks amazing. John, did you say you got to look at his wheat? John, I... Yeah. So Larry's got this system down. Larry's been doing things that I haven't had success with. I haven't had a lot of success planting a spring cover crop mix, terminating it because I, there's this, this evil dirty thing called kosher that refuses to die. So I really struggle with getting that, getting that system work. One thing that we tried this year is we did a summer cover crop. I rolled that summer crop of cover crop and then we sprayed it with Paraquat. And then we drilled wheat into it. Um, if it does not rain, nothing really works. So I don't know how fantastic that's going to end up working out for us. Um, so those are the things that we have to do with our cover crops. You're better off doing Milo corn, Milo corn rotation than you are doing wheat, corn, fallow. Because you have that long fallow period and anything you built up with the aggregates is going to be baked out and all your biology is going to be killed. And long fallow periods just do not set you up to be able to build or create any life within your soils. So where we where you guys saw that earthworm, I haven't introduced cover crops to that field. That's a seven seven years of continual cash crops. It was wheat, uh, corn, or wheat, milo, corn, and then uh, oats, and then back to corn, back to milo, and then milo. That's been the, the rotation on, and we finally got earthworms back on that, that field. I may have earthworms on some of the other stuff we've been doing, you know, cover crops and rotation. I just haven't found them yet. So um, we want to reduce our, the, the, we want to add cover crops with our cash crops, even in our dry land systems. We are extremely dry here. I'll have a picture I'm going to show you here in a little bit. We have to be integrating cover crops into our milo and our corn. I did some even on wheat this year. So, what we did on our wheat was daikon radishes, like it was one pound of daikon radish, one pound of, of um, purple top turnip, and I think one, one or two pounds of uh, red clover. But plants want to share micronutrients with other plants, and it makes them more drought tolerant, and I'll show that in a second. But we have to be figuring out systems that we can intercede cover crops within our milo and our corn, because that's the future. And the other thing that I think it can do is, which is extremely hard in our dry and arid conditions, if I get clovers interceding with my corn and I get um, annual ryegrass interceding with my corn, when the winter hits, those two won't die. So in the early spring, I'll have those living roots. It won't be that much, but I don't want that much because of how dry it is. I don't want it to be sucking out the moisture, but it will keep the biology alive and keep our aggregate stability going within our fields. Okay, that's a theory. I don't know if it'll work, but we have to be trying new things to see if they're, they're going to work. Kevin, how many failures have you had compared to successes in the last 20 years? More. more failures? Same as us, by a lot. But you have to accept, if you're going to be changing these things, you have to accept failure. All right? That's been the hardest thing. Dad does not like fail. I don't like failing either. It's just like, like the unknown, that's terrifying to some people. But we have to be willing and have the courage to step out into those unknowns. Um, don't change all at once. Okay, this is really important to me because if we did everything I wanted to do on large scale, we've gone bankrupt already. Dad has saved us from going bankrupt because I'm like, hey, we're going to do this. And he's like, hey, do that on one field first. I'm like, no, no, this is really going to work. Hey, I don't think so. Try it on one field. I'm like, all right, I'm going to try it. I'm going to show him. Well, okay, he was right. That would have been terrible. All right, don't try large scale some of these practices. Do it in like, do it on one field over here and another field in another part of the county and see if rain differences or, or different things are helping you and just destroy your excuses. You, we have all the excuses in the world to not try the or not implement in these practices. But look, I showed you the like they are projecting that we're going to be out of topsoil in 60 years. I don't know if that is accurate or not, but eventually we're going to run out of topsoil. I would rather not 
kick that can down the road for the next generation to find out. I would rather try to figure it out now so that my great grandkids are still farming in Western Kansas. Um, I always hear this. You can't grow cover crops in Western Kansas. It's true dry. I've got friends in Iowa that I talk to about all this stuff all the time. You know what they tell them in Iowa? Can't get cover crops in. It's too wet. Can't do it. This ground can't even get into the ground. This is just too wet all the time. Can't, can't do cover crops. Wherever you live, if you don't want to do it, you'll have, you'll find an excuse. Cover crops work everywhere. Everywhere you go, cover crops and soil health principles work. We have to figure out how to make it work and not lose our farm. And that's why I'm telling you, start small and move out from there. Um, these are all the challenges we face. I, I know chill it, tillage is cheap. Um, keeping a living root in the ground does suck out the moisture. So like, look, as we build our soil structure, we're also going to be taking out moisture. We're trying to create filtration, but in that process, we're going to have a lag where we're going to have yield drags. It, I, I'm not telling you it's all, you know, unicorns and rainbows and it's all awesome. It's a challenge, but that does not mean that's not the direction that we need to, to, to head. We have yet to plant a cover crop this year might be the exception. We've yet to plant a cover crop where the next year that it was, the yield was better. It always seems to be better, like summer, I mean, uh, corn following wheat. I've never been able to have corn following cover crop outdo corn following wheat, except for this year, possibly. Like that, we had that one corner on our irrigated circle that had, was 60 bushel an acre corn, and nothing around the house was that high. The other part of the field on the east side of the field, what it was only like 15 there on 22, 25. So I have no idea where on one field on the corners on one side, 10 acres was 60 some bushels. And then you get to the other corners connected to the other field, which was 60 acres and it was 25. But I'm, I'm not saying that everything has been a colossal success for us, but I also know that tillage is not a success for us either. Just because you're making money does not mean you're going in the right direction. Right? We want to be farming in this area for a long time, not, not destroying our soils. You don't have livestock. Um, I have no idea what ne needs to go in my mixes. I hate change. I'm afraid of failing. What will, what will they say at the coffee shop? I, I was talking to some friends. I was like, what's the biggest challenge for you? I was like, man, I was really worried what everybody was going to say about me in the coffee shop. I was like, you're kidding. It's like, no, man, everybody talks out around here. And I was talking to my buddy, like Roy, he's like, he told me that everybody in his town, like his, his insurance, uh, uh, his crop insurance adjuster said, you have no idea what they say around you about around town, do you? And he's like, no, what do they say? And then he went on and just told him how, like, how much they make fun of Roy. I'm like, Roy is one of the most brilliant men I know and people in this community make fun of him. You have to get past caring what people say about you. I mean, I, I have a, a TikTok video with thousands upon thousands of views of a guy making fun of me. I don't care, right? Whether, whether or not people in Greeley County accept me or not, I, I don't care. You have to get beyond what people say about you, okay? Forget about it. It does not matter what somebody else says about you. Focus on what you know you need to be doing and go in that direction. All right, solutions to the problem. This is what I encourage you guys to try, especially if you're from Greeley County. Pick one field to do cover crops on, summer mix, cash crop, summer mix, cash crop. I think that's that's a really good system to, to, to go into. Like I said, talk to Larry Purdy if you're from Greeley County because he's had some really good success with spring mixes. Um, you have to be thinking about building those aggregates. Start pulling up your plants and looking at them to have them tell you what you are. Tell, like, look at your plants and you'll see if you're starting to build your soil. Um Pick a handful of your fields to just start doing straight cash crops on. You will not have a fantastic yield year to year, but trust me, it is so much better than doing straight, you know, a, a rotation where you have a fallow period in there because your fallow period is killing your, your aggregates. Uh, Clint is not here today. Talk to your local NRCS agent. As far as I know, we are the only people in our county to get approved for the EQIP program in the last three or four years because the equip program has shifted over to where they're focused on these regenerative practices. So they're paying people who are doing regenerative practices. They're paying us like $54 an acre for the, the cover crops. And then they're paying us $10 an acre for the no-till. 
So as you get started in these deals, get, pick one field to get your cover crops going in and then talk to your NRCS agent. Tanya, am I right on that? It's Raise your hand real quick, Tanya. Tanya will be able to answer a lot of your questions during your lunch period on how to get enrolled in the eQuip program, what they're looking for. Like Tanya doesn't have you come in and it's like, oh, you're a nice farmer. I'm going to accept you. Oh, you were kind of a jerk to me. I'm not going to accept you. It has nothing to do with it. It's what your farming practices have been and whether or not they can accept you based on the government guidelines for those things. So talk to them. They'll tell you what you need to get doing to get started in your area that will help you uh, get or qualify for the eQuip program. That eQuip program, it's like, is it $425,000, Tanya? Yeah, well, I mean the lifetime of the deal. The government is handing out $450,000 to people doing cover crops. Okay, so... People have mixed feelings about this because they know it's a government welfare program for farmers, all right? Look, they're handing out money. If they can help me keep sustainable, I'm going to go apply for the money that they're just handing out. If they have a vote and they want to end it all, we can vote and end it all, and I'm fine voting to end it all. But as long as they're just printing out money and somebody else is going to take it, I'm going to apply for the money that they're printing out because I'm already doing the principles that they're paying out for. So it should be the same for you guys. If you want to get going down this path, look into what you can do to get some of these government programs. Because if you're thinking about shifting and transitioning your farms, I don't, I can't tell you you're going to be wildly successful doing a cover crop and then a cash crop. But if they're paying you $50 an acre, that helps offset the cost as you get into this program. And then 10 years from now, when you can take on an inch of rain and capture all of it, that's when it will pay off because your cash crop will be getting every single bit of the rain it gets, not just 10% of it because the rest of it ran off. You have to eliminate phosphorus. Like, Dad, uh, this that I thought that was going to be the hardest thing to sell Dad on, and we did it last year, and then we did it this year. So last year, we did not apply any phosphorus to any of our, our fall crops, and then this year, we didn't do it to any crops, fall crops or cash crops, and we reduced our nitrogen by 50%. Um, interseeding cover crops is the way to go going into the, are going into the future. The reason I believe this is because plants share micronutrients with other plants. This is in 2019, the last year it actually rained. But even in the year last year it actually rained, we had a dry period there in August where it did not rain in August. The corn on the right is burning up. The cover crop mix, which is twice as many plants per acre as the corn is not burning up. Why is the corn green when it has twice as many plants competing with it for moisture and micronutrients and all the other things and the corn on the right is burning up? Why is that happening? The water cycle. The water cycle. What else? Plants share micronutrients with other plants. Okay? So as these plants share micronutrients with other plants, it makes them more drought tolerant. We can figure out what plants can we can plant with corn that won't take out as much moisture and we can make our corn green all summer long, even in the drought, because they're sharing micronutrients with one another. We have aggregate stability, so we are getting water filtration down in our plants and we can figure out a way to make this work. Um, Lucinda is, this is how we did it last year, but I wanted to show this real quick. Lucinda from Eastern Kansas has been interceding cover crops in her milo. So these are things that we can do. This, if you want to start doing this and do it cheap, we bought a 520 disc drill. This is a John Deere disc drill. And we dropped off every third row so we could intercede two rows of cor uh, uh, cover crops within our corn. You don't want a thick mix. Um, I think ours was around 12 pounds an acre. Um, if you want to ask uh, Dylan where you at, do you guys sell a lot of cover crop mixes to go intercede into cr corn? Sure. You can... Good. See, the, uh, the corn plant also has the stomata on the bottom of the leaf where they can absorb moisture transpired from the cover crops. Oh, awesome. See, I didn't even know that. That's the water cycle. Yeah. There you go. So... And because of that, they're having good luck interseeding uh, corn or inter intergrowing corn in alfalfa. Okay. Where the alfalfa will fix nitrogen. What's better, 30 or 60? So if you have 60 inch rows, you're going to have a, a yield drop. And, but if you have the, the forage growing in between there, you can really make up the difference if you're integrating cat, livestock in it after your harvest. So the best estimates that I've seen is like a 10, 
uh, 10% yield drag off your, um, I think Ryan said that he was, he was about 20 bushels less where he, it was like, he raced 240 bushels in Iowa and he was like 220 where he, he did 60 inches, but he, he made up for it cause he grazed stalkers on the, on the stuff that, that he interceded. We we are going to do 60 inch rows on a little bit just to see what we have going there. I, we just bought this Hineker drill. So this Hineker is what we're going to be using in 2023 um, to interseed cover crops in. You can also th do it to where it's every 15 inch spacing and plant Milo um, and other row crops, but this is what we're going to be using to interseed cover crops in 2023. This is our corn in 2021. Like I said, this is Lucinda doing a cover crops in her, in her corn. They're doing a lot of soybeans and wheat planted together. They'll drill the wheat and then they'll skip the spacing and then they'll plant the soybeans in between it and they put um, guards on their header so it pushes the soybeans down as the, the header goes through there and they harvest their wheat and have the soybeans grown in between there. This is more profitable than corn, like by far, everywhere. They're, like a lot of guys are just ditching corn because they can do this and be more profitable. Um, so uh, when you're doing um, continual cash crop, I don't think that that's the most ideal system. You want to be getting cover crops in there. But as far as profitability, I think you better off profitability wise. So like when we talk about these transitions, you want to be thinking about how many acres you can get into cover crops, how many acres you can be getting into continual cash crops. And then for the rest of it, do whatever you think is going to work best for your farming operation and to stay financially viable. Um, I need to keep going. So I, this is really important too. Like make sure you're networking. This is Larry Purdy. Larry inspires me a lot because like, unless you like call Larry, you don't really know what's going on. Larry's kind of like quiet. Like Hudson, do you know who Larry is? Exactly. So like we live in the same community and Hudson doesn't even know it because we know him because Larry doesn't get out that much. Um, this is, this is something that everybody in this room should be doing. We are, unless you're like Kevin and you're 20 years into it, like, and even Kevin's going to start doing some compost extract. We are so dry in our areas. The most of the people that came to this, you guys are under 20 inches of rain for your annual precipitation. It is so hard to build the biology, even if you're doing cover crops, because it, it will have these long periods like where we're dry and then that biology dies because of the heat. All right. And as we're trying to build back our systems, if we're going from tillage to do adding cover crops, there's no biology there for the plant to be stimulated to put out exudates. So it's going to be tough to get this transition going. So we need to be adding compost extracts into our system. Um, so it'll bring back the biology. Um, this has helped us like this year, like I said, we've eliminated phosphorus and we cut back nitrogen by 50%. I don't think our yields are very much different than our neighbors, which means if, if that's correct, then we saved over $100,000 in input cost because of cutting back nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, compost extract is a liquid extract that is made when you mix or take your compost and we have the, the, uh, the Bio5 extractor that, that Blake is going to go over this afternoon. But you put your compost in a system with liquid and it will break down the compost into a liquid form and then you apply that on your field. So when we say compost extract, we are not talking about manure compost. This is completely different. It's like compost that you make, that you apply to your seeds or in furrow or a foliar application. And this gets the biology back. You can do it by creating Johnson's Thu compost. Like these are, if you want to take a picture of this so you can study these later, you can look up Johnson's Thu, Thu Thermal Aerobic Burma composting, Korean natural farming, spice composting. Neil, what compost method did you say that you really liked? I didn't say I liked it. I tried. Oh, got you. Okay. <laughs> Never mind then. Don't mention it. All right. Okay. So there's a bunch of different ways to, to make compost, all right? Um, Dan has a company, Fed and Happy, and they sell Burma composting. All right? So you don't have to learn every single form and system of composting all right we do know johnson sue i thought a lot about getting into verma composting i would rather just pay dan to send me verma composting then i can mix my johnson sue with verma composting and then with the soil works product the bio 5 make an extract and then i have all that biology from those three different resources 
to get that in my system. Hey, Jay. Yeah. Dan raise his hand. Yeah, right there. Where you at, Dan? I mean, where, where do you, where do you come from? Uh, I just went to Denver and Goodwin. Yeah, Fed and Happy. So if you want to go to the line, Fed and Happy is, is, is where he sells vermicomposting. So these are biological programs, products. These four are, are ones I believe in. Soilworks, Bio5 uh, product that, that they have that they're going to be talking about today. Fed and Happy, the vermicomposting. Ryan Noss is the only person I know that has found a, a product that is a bug in a jug that actually has living fungus in it. And Zach Wright, who I trust, said he looked at this product and it has living fungus in this, in this jug. I don't know how he does it. He's not talking about how, he, how he's done it because he wants to put the patent on it and be able to sell it. But Ryan Noss is the only one. When people try to sell you bugs in a jug, you are much better off buying these products because they are more affordable and they have more biology in them. Okay? Bioag management, Clint Freeze. Um, if you look up their website, Clint's going to start selling some of their biologicals. But when I talk about these things, you're like, oh no, Soilworks, they sponsor this you know, deal. Why are you talking about those things? Because Soilworks believes in all these things. And Soilworks is not here to just take all of your money and say all these people suck and then they're the only ones that have it going. They're a real company that believe in the movement. And that's why they're sponsoring today's show because they don't, they're not selfish or greedy. This is like what the extractor looks like as we're making the extract. That's the machine that we have outside. So we use Johnson Sue and Bio 5. And like I said, I'm going to add Dan's product to, to the mix. Our Johnson Sue compost had 360 species of bacteria and 305 species of fungus in one batch. All right. How do you maintain consistency in that? You can't. Simple, simple answer is you can't maintain consistency. But the thing is, is I don't care about consistency because I'm just building life. And until, like, I don't know how you maintain consistency because one year I may have different fungal spores on my corn or, you know, on this. And then I just got compost from uh, Kyle Schnell and I, I made an extract and I sprinkled that, or I mean, I spread that on all of my compost piles. So that biology I added from Kyle's stuff, I'll never be able to replicate that in, unless I'm able to replicate it with extracts that I keep pouring onto the, the different deals. But the more biology you get in your system, the better off because like the plants are able to dis like especially on foliar when you apply a foliar application to your to your field the the biology falls onto the like let's say we apply a foliar application our wheat so this year i buy you know compost extract um i i buy bio five from soil works and i i make an extract and then i, I add fish meal to it and i brew it and make a tea and then i apply that foliar okay to my wheat fields when I apply that foliar to my wheat fields, it falls onto the stomata of the plant and the plant knows which biology is feeding it and which is beneficial and it will feed those, those bacteria and fungus. And in turn, those funguses penetrate the stomata of the leaf and then you do not have to spray for stripe rust because those beneficial funguses, there's not a beneficial fungus that, ex that or, I'm sorry, there's not a, a parasitic fungus that can't be killed by a beneficial fungus. So as soon as you give these beneficial funguses on your on your the stomata of the leaf of the wheat plant, no more stripe rust ever. You have to you probably have to have to apply it for a while until you get the, these these bio, biologicals in your field, but you will not have to ever spray for stripe rust because those beneficial funguses will kill those negative ones. On the offset of that, if you spray for stripe rust, you're killing every single population of fungus that you can imagine. What's the first thing that can come back to your field? Parasitic funguses. So as soon as you spray to kill stripe rust, you're just opening the plant up to get more stripe rust in the future because it, you've killed any beneficial fungus that might be out there that might help save the plant. So that's how you can get these biologicals uh, on there is foliar, in furrow, or... Um, Seed treatment. Thank you for saying that. Yep. Uh, we'll get we'll get to that. Um, this is how we. What's up? Let, let me hold the question so the the, the end, or the end. Okay. Write it down so you remember what you're gonna ask me. This is how we make it. Uh, you take the shell off a chemical tote and then you drill holes in it. You line that with weed barrier mat. And I've got a whole presentation at the or later on this afternoon on how to build them. There's a built one right over there in the corner. 
Um, you can fill the, like if you have children, that's the best way to fill it because then you don't have to be the one filling it. And you're teaching your kids hard work. <laughs> this is what we did is we cut the bottom out of a, out of a lick tub and put a wire mesh in there. And so what we'll do is we'll put the product that we want to make the uh, compost and we'll talk more about that and we'll wash it through there. And then we put it in the extractor, or I mean the, in the, in the Johnson Sioux bioreactor. That's what it looks like going in. That's what it looks like full. That's what it looks like a couple weeks into it. Once the fungus starts sprouting, this is a month into it. And this is what it looks like today. This still has a few more months to get finished, but this is what the, as, as it goes around and we'll pass this around. This is what finished compost looks like. You guys want to pat here, Corey, I'll start over here. On, on this, you go to your dairy in that, I'm back behind you. Go to your dairy and you tell them I want uh, wheat straw and you pay 90 bucks for your entire feed truck to be full of wheat straw and then you can go and you can make nine bioreactors with that wheat straw. 90 bucks is my input cost if I want to make one. Your, your input ingredients. Okay, yeah, yeah, so on the stuff that I passed around on this spur, I don't know which was which. One was 60% corn stalks, uh, 20% um, uh, grass clippings, and then 10% uh, horse manure and 10% wood chips. And then I flipped them. I did wheat straw and, and corn straw. So I'll, I'll talk more about what you want to make them with in the next presentation. Um, this is how we're applying it. So when we apply it uh, in furrow on with the corn, it goes where we used to be putting down phosphorus. And we just put it in furrow eight gallons an acre. So two pounds of compost will make the eight gallons an acre we need to go in furrow. A foliar application, you want to do 20 gallons an acre. And I said brew a tea. Don't do a foliar application with your spray rig with tea because it will, the biology and the fungus will, will multiply so quickly, you'll plug up the screens on your sprayer. So you want to make an extract and then apply it. Am I wrong on that, Dan? Can you, have you made a tea that you can, sp you can spray on? It's challenging. Okay, yeah, so if, if you have an irrigated circle, that's the best place to get a tea in is if you do that and then, you know, make some trials and stuff i make some extracts before you plug up your, you know, your, your deal and then blame me for plugging up your deal. Uh, oh, and then six ounces for 50 pounds of, uh, of, uh, Milo. So when we're doing Milo, we'll rip open the bag. We'll pour it in there. We'll do 16 ounces of extract. The boys rake it with a uh, hose and we just pour another bag of Milo. It's a long process, but I know that it's all getting in there when I had the boys do it and I'm not doing it. The boys are doing it. It's a lot quicker when we're doing it on this, is how we treat wheat seed. We have a chemical tote that we have above that. It's full of, of extract and we just open up the valve and it's a real scientific process. I'm like, uh, open it here and I hope that that's going to be right. So if we get enough or too much on there, then we just let it sit for two hours and then we run it onto another truck. So John told me that you want to do 70 gallons, John Nicewanger, 70 gallons for 500 bushels. Or, so that's what we started doing. And I realized I liked doing more. So I would be, start doing like 100 to 120 gallons and I'd let it sit on the truck and I'd switch it. If you do that and you let it sit on the truck and you did more than 70 gallons for 500 bushels, it will cake up, get hot, and you will run your, your truck, your wheat. Okay. We did it with about 100 bushels of beardless trit. We got it too hot. So we did that beardless trit with like 70 gallons on 300 bushels and it was too much. So I did 120 on 500 bushels, which was way too much. We let it sit. We switched it to another truck and it was fine. So as long as you let it sit there, you know, and soak in the, the, the moisture and then move it, then you're fine. All right. So you see this right here. This is the response we got from the first application. Which has better above ground growth? Corn on the, corn on the left. The corn on the left did not got, get any compost extract. It got 180 pounds of nitrogen and 40 pounds of phos. This got no nitrogen, no phos. So it's clear that we're seeing a deficiency from the lack of nitrogen and lack of phos, right? What do we have here? We have three times the length on that root length than we do on that, those roots over there. This is exactly what I was talking about. When you have phosphorus, the plant does not go to work. When you have compost extract, the plant goes to work, puts out the huge root system and is harvesting the micronutrients it needs to have a healthy plant. Okay? So this is 2021. So Lynn, where you at? Raise your hand. Raise your hand big, Lynn. 
Glenn sent me this picture last week. So Glenn made Johnson Sioux compost. He treated it like I did with Mez. You can't even see it in the photo, but there's little sprouts there. This is his, uh, his test. What do you call that when you have a it, control? Thank you. So this is his control, and then this is the wheat with compost extract, okay? Wheat with compost extract destroyed Mez and destroyed no compost extract. You see what it's doing for your plants? It's bringing life back to your plants so it functions the way it's supposed to. Okay. This is why it works. We're adding the biology that we've been destroying for years. Dr. James White has done a lot of research. If you want to look up Dr. James White, he's got a lot of cool you videos on YouTube, but Dr. James White, Rutgers University, otherwise you'll get highlights from James White, the football player. So James White has found that the bacteria and fungal endophytes actually penetrate the, the, the seed. So when I treat my seed, the wheat seed, the reason it's responding is because bacteria and fungal endophytes actually penetrate the seed. And so you're actually uh, having that bacteria and fungus interact with the genome of, of, the, of the, the seed. And that's the way it's supposed to be in nature. A seed's supposed to be falling into healthy ground. The fungus and bacteria penetrate naturally in the ground. We've destroyed our fungal colonies to where now we have to put phos, we have to put nitrogen, or we get hardly any growth. And so as farmers now, today, we think that the only way that plants can grow is if we're adding a jack ton of nitrogen and jack ton of phosphorus. Do they have a jack ton of phosphorus and nitrogen in the Garden of Eden? No. They did not. So if we heal this system, we can start having these plants function the way they should. This is, um, this is a complete nutrition digestion um, report that I did with um, uh, Regen Ag Labs. So guys, if you have soil samples set off, you want to start working with Regen Ag Labs. They're the only company that really understands this. This is the laboratory that you want to work with. Regen Ag Labs. Say, this, this soil sample showed that we have 3,000, three, or 33,600, no, that's, that's carbon. So this shows how much of value of carbon we have in our, our field. This is the nitrogen. Sorry, you can't really see it. See the nitrogen now? See the word nitrogen? Okay, this is nitrogen. All right, we have 3,000 pounds of nitrogen in our field. I would have to apply 7,000 pounds of MES. Not MES, sorry, urea. I'd have to apply 7,000 pounds of urea to get that much nitrogen. But what's the problem with that nitrogen? What is it? It's not plant available. So I don't have access to that nitrogen, but it is sitting in our field. This is how many pounds of phosphorus we have. 1,200 pounds. In our soil in Greenland County, what does our phosphorus get tied up with? Calcium. So we have our phosphorus, it's tied up. It's out there, but we can't have access to it with our plants. Now, I apply compost extract and this is the, the soil the the uh the sample that we sent off to biomakers biomakers did an, a dna analysis on our compost and that dna analysis found they identified the 360 species of bacteria and 307 species of fungus of those 600 species of microbiology in my compost 83 percent of them made inorganic nitrogen plant of sorry made organic nitrogen plant available so that the plant could take it up. All right, 83%. That compost is full of biology that's going to give access to our, our plant, access to the nitrogen potassium. So potassium, 49%, phosphorus, 49%. So over 300 species of bacteria and fungus in that compost makes phosphorus plant available. It breaks down the phosphorus that's attached to the calcium and makes it available for the plant. So with 1,200 pounds of phosphorus, how many years of phosphorus do I have sitting in my field? 130. A bunch of geniuses see my YouTube videos and they're like, yeah, well, tell, call me in 10 years when your phosphorus levels are all gone. I'm like, well, I'll call you in 130 years when it's all gone. Because that's how long it's going to take. The other thing is, is how, what percent of phosphorus do we get to utilize when we apply it to our fields? We know this. How much gets tied up? Over 80%. We're paying a lot of money for phosphorus and we lose 80%. Alan, 
How often do you invest in a product that you lose 80% of your investment? Not very often. Farmers do every single year. We invest in phosphorus and we lose 80% of our investment every single year, but we keep applying it. So, and this is, this is the test strip that we did in 2021. We did three test strips. You can only see A and B. We applied 180 pounds of nitrogen, 40 pounds of FOSS. No nitrogen, no FOSS. So this right here goes to this corn. This right here goes to this corn. This raised 238 bushels an acre. This was 200 bushels an acre. 180 pounds of nitrogen, no nitrogen. We were still more profitable over here, but in the test strip that you can't see over here, 242 bushels an acre, four bushels an acre better with half the nitrogen and no phosphorus. Do I need to be applying phosphorus to my fields anymore? No, my great, great grandkids maybe, but hopefully they found a better source of phosphorus than mez that causes my plant to be lazy and not put out exudates and not build soil. We can change our systems and we can change our systems quickly with compost extract, but we have to start figuring out how to do these things in our own context, our own area. This is a great YouTube video. Corey Miller's on it. Corey saw a 100% increase in the amount of hay they hayed this year from the first year of applying compost extract to his hay ground. A 100% increase on native grass that they hay for hay just the first year that they applied compost extract. So in 2022, um, we raised 207 bushel corn without applying nitrogen on a five acre test strip. Um, I, I was really frustrated with this year because I did three circles and there's no consistency. Like we did, um, we did 100 pounds of nitrogen on every field. We didn't do phosphorus on any field. And then each field we did two test strips on, on each field. Field A, we did uh, no nitrogen and we did 50 pounds of, of nitrogen and it was 207 bushels an acre where there was no nitrogen and 204 bushels an acre where there's 50 pounds of nitrogen. On the next two fields, we did 75 pounds and 50 pounds and everywhere there was 75 pounds or 50 pounds beat everywhere there was uh, 75 pounds and 50 pounds was the most profitable on those two circles and it was the least profitable on circle A. So, I mean, I was, it was really kind of confusing. I don't think we're gonna do any test strips in the future because we're gonna start doing foliar applications of nitrogen through the pivot. And so I'm not gonna be able to do test strips anymore. Um, I wish I could to keep, you know, getting the information out there. But I mean, if I'm able to get to where I'm only applying 50 pounds of nitrogen in the beginning, and then later on I can do 50 pounds, then I know I'm gonna be able to sustain my root development by doing it that way. And I, I think that that's going to be best for, for our farm and what we're doing. Um, so on our dry land, people ask this because I forget to mention this a lot. We raised 80 bushel corn with 50 or with 40 pounds of nitrogen and no FOSS. That was our best field. Our averages were like four, in the 40s for both Milo and corn. 45 on both. So we averaged 41 on Milo and 40, uh, 45, and our, our average precipitation this year was 11 inches. So that was that was with 40 pounds of nitrogen and no phosphorus. Um, these are the things that we need to change. So we need to start trying new things. You need to be bold every single year and you need to try new things. Everybody that I know that is advanced in what they're doing in regenerative agriculture is not afraid of failing and they're always trying new, th uh, new things. Realize um, how much you're going to increase. So Stan, if I gave you $1,000 today, does that change your financial outlook? No. But if I give you $1,000 a day, will that change your financial look outlook? We need to realize that change, when we see change, it seems incredibly slow. I don't feel like I've changed that much from last year to this year. I don't notice that much that much as far as what I know is uh, the soil. But then when I think back about it, I'm like, okay, I learned this difference between this and this. And I, and I learned that and I learned that. And as I start to look at things as I've changed over the years, I'm like, I've changed a lot in the last six years. I've increased a lot of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding the last six years, but it doesn't feel like I increased that much knowledge in the last month. And sometimes we look at people, like I remember when I got started and I mean, 
Ben, I, I remember seeing you at the at the bottom line conferences. Like, man, I wish I knew as much about grazing as as Ben does. You know, and and you look at other people and you almost see where they're at, and you're like, it's impossible to get where this person is because they have so much more wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Well, that's okay. Do you guys know how you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. That's what we're doing is we're taking one bite of the elephant, one bite at a time. If I if I started a diet and I lost two pounds and my goal was 40 pounds, should I quit after the first week of only losing two pounds? No, that would be silly. In the same way, we have to realize this mountain that we have to climb is going to take time and it's going to be hard. And we're going to climb it by going one step up the mountain at a time. We're not going to see overnight changes on our fields. It's going to take time. I love this book, For the Love of the Soil, about my Nicole Masters. That's a great book to read. Like I said, Dirt is a good book to read. Start looking for resources. Watch as many YouTube videos as possible and start uh, researching people that are going to help you to change, to become a better farmer. And then look around this room. Like all the, the farmers across this room have done a lot of incredible and amazing things. And so many of you guys it, inspire me. Like Kevin Wilty inspires me so much. Brigham, what he's doing with those kids is inspiring me. Uh, Corey, the stuff that you and Matthias are doing is awesome. Mike, I can't imagine how difficult it would be to be an organic gardener in Eastern Colorado. Like all the things, Neil, like I talked to you for like two seconds. I'm like, wow, that guy's way for, like, where I need to be, right? Every single person, Dan, every time I talk to you, I think, man, I need to talk to Dan more because I, every time I, I walk away from these conversations with Dan, I'm learning something. Iron sharpens iron. We're going to become better farmers and better at what we do when we, when we stop being afraid of what we don't know and just take the step forward and just take the next step forward and decide that I'm going to figure out how to make regenerative agriculture work in my context and I'm going to become a better farmer every single day by what I'm applying in, in every moment. Like I'm a regenerative farmer and I'm changing the world. That's why I said change the world by changing your farm is the topic of this conversation because every single one of you are world changers, whether you like it or not. And about five of you have made the comment this morning about people in your area, like you're glad you came here because nobody in your area like listens to you and it's hard to talk to people from your area. Okay, raise your hand if you're from Tribune. Okay, what, like, Rick, keep your hand if you're raised from Tribune. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Okay, 12, looks like we got about 10%. 10% drove 30 miles. The rest of you drew way, way further than that. And I'm, I'm sorry to tell you that that's just the way it is. But if you're going to change the world, it starts with these little conversations talking to your, your, your neighbors every single time you get a chance to talk to them, just talk to them, encourage them, tell them what you're doing, tell them that they can do it. And when you come back to them, just keep talking to them, keep talking to them because eventually you're going to get people around you that are like-minded and they're going to come up with a crazy idea and you're like, that might just work. You know what? And that might work. And then you're going to have all that, that effort going together in what you're doing and you're going to change your own communities, but it's not going to change overnight. Do not get discouraged. I've been talking to my people in my community for six years. I've dreamed about this day for six years. The first deal of I came to, I'm like, I can't wait till I do that in Tribune. And when I planned this in August, I was like, this is going to be great. We'll have 50 people from Tribune and hopefully 10 people outside of Tribune will come. And we're just going to change our, our area and it's going to be so awesome. Neither of those two things happened. And it's okay because the, the people that are in this room that want to change are going to change. And we're going to change our, each other's lives online. And we're going to change, like the people are from Tribune, we're going to become better farmers together. And I want to close with this verse. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded upon the seas and established upon the rivers. This is one of my favorite Psalms. And I said at the beginning that God, is, in my prayer, that God is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. So he's the beginning of my talk because I talked or I prayed about it. And he's the end of my talk because he's everything in my life. Everything I do with farming involves with what God created. He spoke the world into existence. And so all that life I get to interact with in my soil that I think is fascinating. God created all that life. And he, when I go to go to Colorado and speak in Colorado, I see the mountains and I'm blown away by the beauty and the majesty of the mountains. 
And do you know what's more exciting about the life within the soil and the majesty of the mountains? Is that the most beautiful thing to God is you. You are the most beautiful thing that he created in his eyes. I get really excited about the soil. I get excited about the mountains and all of you people drive me nuts, right? People get on my nerves, but God does not see it that way. God looks at us and he loves every single one of us unconditionally more than we can ever fathom. And not only that, he loves us so much that he died for us. And so sometimes I talk about this. I had a lovely individual come up to me and say, Jay, that was super heavy handed that you talked about God at the end of your presentation because your presentation was about soil and I felt like you were proselytizing me. And I said, I'm sorry it felt that way, but like everything I am and every part of my being testifies to what God's done in my life. So I can't not mention it at like in my talk because like the, when I wake up in the morning, the reason I'm excited to work with soil is because of what God's done in my life. I used to not love being a farmer. I love being a farmer now. And if, and if I can't tell you the most important thing in my life, there's no point in doing any of this. Because if I can't tell you all these awesome things about soil and I, I can't tell you that the one that created the soil also created you and loves you, what's the point? So I encourage you guys, as you're pursuing soil health, pursue the one who created the soil, who's given you the ability to be a good steward of the soil he created. Thank you.